How are you all doing today? I'm trying a bit of a different camera angle. Let's see how this how this works. Um, Ah, there we go. How are you all doing today? I just, uh, I've got, oh, it's 11 o'clock already. I'm behind the game today. I didn't sleep, I don't think, five minutes all night last night again. These will keep me awake. <laughs> They're bad for me. Yes, they are. They sure are tasty. Oh, so much going on. So many things to pray for. I'm trying a different uh, camera angle. How, how does this look? It's not quite as square on. It's from up above. Um, maybe somebody messaged me. Does this look okay like this or is it uh is it just too much i can see uh behind me so much more you can see the picture of valerie and my grandson behind me and uh our fishing group uh from behind um, so excited about today this is the last of my romans uh sermons i'm going to change over to something else uh, if you have any suggestions that would be great. It would be fun to try a challenge day where you challenge me to preach on something just uh, uh, right off the cuff and see how I would do. Gee, it'd be, it'd be fun to try that, just to see how that would go. Uh, I wonder how much trouble I could get myself in. Uh, probably a fair bit. <laughs> As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name, knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. I hope you will be. I hope you'll be blessed today. Our little bit of time together. It's kind of a cloudy day. It was nice about five o'clock this morning. It was really sunny out. I I was in the garage and I opened the garage door and sat and looked out uh, for a while this morning and then I, uh, I'm uh, getting my seeds ready uh, for Valerie uh, for doing her planting and so I'm making these big trays of 72 uh, little seedlings and uh, I guess I've got 
I've got about eight trays now. So how many is that? That's eight times 72. There's one lot of flowers I've planted. And then uh, these will all be uh, for Valerie to plant come spring, wherever she decides she wants them. The biggest problem is, is that I don't know what seeds are in what trays. <laughs> so she has no idea what she's going to be planting. <laughs> So it's going to make a real interesting looking garden. There will be things all over the place that we have no idea what, what they are until they actually start to flower. But uh, that's that. I, I have these two massive trees I'm trying to sell to somebody. And uh, I can't get anybody to, to take them. Uh, they're beautiful, beautiful big trees. And they're taking up my room in my garage where I do my planting. So I, I keep hoping somebody's going to step forward and take these big, big, beautiful trees. Let us begin. I thought we'd begin again, of course, with Helen Steiner Rice. New Concepts and Old Commandments Living as we do today in a world of speed and greed, we are restless and dissatisfied, and we recognize a need for something to alleviate our constant state of stress. Something will, that will change dull days to hours of happiness. Something new and different to excite our bored existence, which we so foolishly attempt to change with rash resistance. By protesting we're entitled to the carnal-minded things, believing we'll be satisfied with the pleasure this life brings. And in our discontentment, we disregard restrictions and decide to seek our happiness in delinquent derelictions. We renounce our morals and ethics and reject all discipline, forgetting the commandments governing now outmoded sin. We are sure in our new freedom with our lust and greed unleashed, the pinnacle of pleasure will certainly be reached. But man cannot desecrate his soul or defy God's changeless laws, for the age-old Ten Commandments stand untouched by human flaws. And until man comes to realize he must live and still obey the commandments that God handed down way back in Moses' day, he will never find contentment, and his search will be in vain. For what we thought was pleasure will return to him in pain. For man, with all his greatness, his knowledge, and his skill, is still as helpless as a child and subject to God's will. And there is nothing man can do to bring lasting joy and peace or curb his untamed passions or make his longings cease. But the humble, full acknowledgement that there is no sub substitute to bring forth a happy harvest except the Spirit's fruit. For unless man's spirit is redeemed, he will never, never find unblemished love and happiness and an eternal peace of mind. Boy, is that ever right on with what I'm preaching today. Um, and uh, as always, let us say together uh, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <clears throat> Let us pray. Oh, Father, stir up your power and come. Take away the hindrance of our sins and make us ready for the celebration of your return to this earth, that we may receive you in joy and serve you always, each and every day, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and we, Lord, wish to serve you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, as I said, this is my last message on Romans. And uh, um, I thought I would look at Romans 12, 1 through 2. Now, you would think that you couldn't put together a sermon for just two verses of Scripture. But, boy, is there a lot we can say about this. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that what is good and acceptable and perfect, the will of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but ye, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that what, that what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Boy. That's amazing. Now here's another translation. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There is a tension within our culture today. On the one hand, we see the need for and have a desire to change. And it's true about certain things, especially concerning ourselves. We are bombarded today with the message that if we were only slimmer or tanner or thicker hair or better dressed, more in style, if we could talk better, if our teeth were a little whiter, a little straighter, if we were better financed, better perfumed, if we would be happier, if we smiled more, if the smiles didn't create lines, we would be better people. That somehow if we bought into what the world tells us is a better person, that we would be happy and satisfied and we'd finally know why we're here and there'd be purpose for life. Oh, your white teeth would just give you such perfect for life or such, such a reason for living. Those white teeth. And if you could just get rid of that mole on your cheek, oh, life would be so much better for you. And we buy into it. We buy into it because, well, it's everywhere. It's in every magazine. It's on every TV show. It's on every commercial. We're constantly, constantly wanting to change. And, sh and so I shovel it in and then I try to burn it off and I shovel more in and I try to burn it off. And I'm, I'm going to listen to the McDonald's advertisements and go to McDonald's. But then I got to also listen to those exercise ad advertisements. So I got to go and I got to exercise. And so I end up spending four or five hours every day shoveling it in and trying to burn it off. And we live our whole lives with this kind of stupidity. And there are certain people we want to be like, certain people we want to be around. And, and, and so we will throw all our knowledge, all our wisdom, all of our faith to the wind to get what we want. Oh, Lord, the stuff I've seen in my life. I, I had a person come to me once. This person had heard me preach for years. And this person came to me and asked me if it would be okay if they left their spouse and ran away with the neighbor's spouse because they had fallen in love and they had had sex a few times and they really enjoyed that. And now they want to keep that going. And so is it okay, Pastor? Is, it, is that okay? And I remember looking at this person and thinking to myself, are, are, are you an idiot? What's the matter with you? 
You have been listening to me preach for all these years, and you're asking me if it's okay to leave your spouse and run away with the neighbor's spouse? That's a question you really want me to answer. What possible answer do you think I'm going to give you? I, I, I remember I couldn't believe my ears. Here was this incredibly churched person asking me if it would be okay. My blessing, I should bless them to run away because... Well, the sex was good, and they're happy, and so throw everything else to the wind, destroy their family, destroy that family, and because it feels good. Man, there is a lot that goes on in this world today because it feels good. We do so much because we think it's going to feel good. I've heard it said time and time again, and I've been saying it for years. It amazes me what people will throw away for a roll in the hay. People will throw whole lives away, families, entire fortunes for a roll in the hay. We are filled with desires, many of them sinful, and they are like seeds that have been planted in our minds, and Satan himself whispers in our ears and tempts us to take on these sinful desires. And so, so often we fall for it. We get slickered into believing that it's possible, that it's okay, because we want it. Some of you are, well, probably all of you are much more sensible people than, than I am. When I fixate on something, I can't get my head away from it. I, I start thinking about that new fishing reel. Oh man, Shimano just came out with this new fishing reel. You should see this thing. It will, well, it'll do everything that all the other ones do, but it, Ah, uh, okay, it's the same th sort of thing, but I want, oh, wretched man that I am. It will do nothing that all my other reels won't do, and I have lots of fishing reels. But once I get it in my head, I can't get it out. These desires for all these things, then we have to change. When we want these things, when we need these things, it requires change. And even the good things in our lives require change. And, well, that's another thing. We want all these things, but we don't want to change. Matter of fact, we rather hate change. Boy, have I learned that lesson in the church. And it took me a long time to learn it because I'm, I'm a little slow. But change doesn't go so well in the church. I remember very, very well that when I came to one church in my life, I was told that the congregation really wanted change. But in a matter of a few weeks, I was told that, man, you know, you're changing too fast. Well, we, we don't want that much change. Just a little change, and only the change that I want, not your change, and it's too much change. Just a little bit of change, please. We're uncomfortable with the uncertainties that change brings. And so even though we even call a pastor to come because this is a different kind of guy and he's going to change, we're rather uncomfortable with the whole thing, and so we want to back him off a bit. At one time, the Duke of Cambridge was reported to have said, any change at any time for any reason is to be deplored. <laughs> any change, any time, for any reason, change should be deplored. As a matter of fact, that was the advice Queen Victoria was given over and over and over again. 
don't try to do good. It means change, and change is always bad. Stay away from change. It sounds like the old saying, come weal, come woe, come status quo. <laughs> come weal, come woe, come status quo. We want change. We just, you know, don't want to do anything to get it. I'm afraid many of us hate change. You know, I, I found over the years, people always say it's going to be the elderly people who don't like change. It's never the elderly people that, the elderly people are used to change and they're always so easy going. I can tell you that in 35 years of doing ministry, the elderly people have never been the problem when it came to change. It's always the ones in their late 50s and early 60s that, you know, they, they think that they've seen it all and they, 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 they like things as they are. And so just leave things alone, Pastor. The following is a letter from the President of the United States, read and then dated January 31st, 1829. This is not a joke. Please listen. This is going to blow you away. This is from President Sir, Jackson. I can't do that right now. Oh, this is my Siri. My, my Siri heard me say something, and my watch is now talking to me. Anyways, this is from President Jackson, and this is a real letter. He wrote this. Or it's, it's written to President Jackson. President Jackson, the canal system of this country is being threatened by the spread of a new form of transportation known as the railroad. The federal government must preserve the canals for the following reasons. One, if boats are supplanted by railroads, serious unemployment is going to result. Captains, cooks, Drivers, hostlers, repairmen, lock tenders will all be left without a means of livelihood. Not to mention the numerous farmers now employed in growing hay for the horses. Two boat builders, two, would suffer and tow line, whip and harness makers would go broke. Three canal boats, three, are absolutely essential to the defense of the United States. In the event of expected trouble with England, the Erie Canal would be the only means by which we could ever move the supplies so vital to waging a modern war. As you well know, Mr. President, railroad carriages are pulled by at the enormous speed of 15 miles an hour by engines that in addition to endangering life and limb of passengers, roar and snort their way through the countrysides, setting fire to crops, scaring the livestock, and frightening women and children. The Almighty certainly never intended that people should travel at such breakneck speed. Sincerely yours, Martin Van Buren, Governor of New York. That is a real letter. Talk about unwillingness for change. Why is it that we resist change so ardently? Perhaps we fear that change will make us more unhappy, that our situation is going to get worse rather than better. I believe and I, I, would, I would argue that I'm dead on with this, that the biggest difficulty with this COVID-19 and the virus thing that's going around is that we've all had to change. Our lives, as we know them, have had to change. Now, I'm not as outgoing as many of you, and so my life hasn't changed that terribly much. I spend a great deal of my day in study and devotion and driving, and today I will spend a great deal of my day in study and devotion and a little bit of driving. What I miss is the people, and I miss worship more than words can say, and I miss Holy Communion. Oh, I miss that so much. I just... 
and I've been holding back. Valerie and I have not shared in Holy Communion at home because I don't want to be unfair to everybody else. And so I'm holding back. But it isn't just that. It's the fact that I can't go and do things. Two days ago, I went to the co-op grocery store. I got my scooter fired up and the batteries charged. And I went to the co-op grocery store. I almost hugged complete strangers. I was so excited to be in proximity to other human beings that I wanted to hug them. People looked at me as if I had screws loose because I had a smile that was lighting up the whole store. I was so excited to see people. We don't want to change. We want our lives back. One of the first things Valerie said when this all started was, Will we ever get to go back to the way it was, Randy? It's a good question. Will we? Will we ever go back to the kind of freedom that we have known? On Sunday morning, when I say, The Lord be with you and also with you, please turn to your neighbor and wish them the peace of the Lord. And in my congregations, the churches, the seats just empty, and people are hugging down the middle aisles, and there's handshakes and hugs, even tears of joy. People are so happy to see each other. And when you go to Mustadum, Everybody there is related, and everybody's happy to see their aunts and their uncles, their cousins, their brothers, their sisters. It's wonderful. You go to Hudson Bay, and it's a small group, but boy, there are some powerful leaders in that church. And when they gather in the middle, you can just see all the energy that exists there at Melfort with all the music and the incredible hostesses that we have there, and all the excitement of gathering together, having a meal, sharing some time together. It's killing us because our lives have had to change. Here at Nippon, oh, I miss our Bible studies so much. Do you know we have about ah, sometimes 40 people on Sundays 35, really, really good Sundays, 50. And uh, oh, Clayton Kemptrop's watching. Oh, I'm so glad to see that. Nice to see you, Clayton. And, you know, there's about 35, 40. Do you know that we get sometimes as many as 15 people at our Bible study? That's one third of what comes to Sunday coming out for Bible study. That's an amazing percentage of people. And we're missing this. Something fierce. We have tremendous studies. The truth is that we don't want to change. Listen, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, Paul says, I urge you, brothers, we are challenged by Paul to change. We are challenged to accept this mercy of God and then do something with it. Without Christ, we all stand condemned. My phone is going dead. I'm just going to have to plug it in here, folks. Just give me a second. Hold on one minute. Well, my phone's going to go dead on me. There we go. Okay, there we go. If we are unwilling to change, then we are unwilling to take the leadership of Christ Jesus in our lives and do as he directs us. Without Christ, we all stand condemned before God. We know this. We are sinners by nature and by choice. But in spite of our sinfulness, God loves us. He sent Jesus to die for us. These are all things we've said a million times and you've said them and you know them. By his great mercy, we are saved. And so we respond to that. We respond to this incredible love that Christ has shown us. How can you not? How can you not? We cannot remain a spectator looking on. I, I, I love this. Someone once described a football game as 22 men on the field 
badly in need of a rest. Being watched by 72,000 people in the stands, badly in need of exercise. Boy, is that ever the truth? 22 men on the field, badly in need of rest, watched by 72,000 people, badly in need of exercise. Christianity should never be like that. It shouldn't be the preacher up front, badly in need of a rest, and 45 or 50 people in the pews, badly in need of getting up and doing something, getting involved. Boy, it can be so costly, not only to our churches, but to our very souls, when we stop allowing Christ to conform us to himself, to change us in the direction he would have us go. I've lost my place. If anything, when we see people who are active Christians and we want to be like them, it should cause us to want to change, even to the point of facing our own martyrdoms. It is that important, and it is that, it's that vital, and that is the nature of the cost I'm talking about because it has eternal consequences. It's not, you know, how much you weigh today or whether that, that pimple can get healed up and taken off of your cheek. It's eternal in its nature. That's God's call to us as his children, as his followers. On top of that, all other worldly causes that deserve our help must come in second to the help and the nature of discipleship as Christ would have us. You are expected as Christians, and I, I remember this from university years ago, uh, I was taking a class at uh, one of the uh, Catholic uh, colleges at the University of Alberta. And uh, uh, it was a huge class. I, I think there were 600 of us in this class. And I remember the professor was a Catholic priest. Uh, I think he was a bishop. And he talked about the universal truths regarding Christianity. He said, there are very few universal truths, universal, but one universal truth for Christians is this. You must, you must share the word of God. You must be a disciple of Christ. You don't get to be a Christian and just sit in your pew and do nothing. As a Christian, a universal a universal call from Christ to us as Christians is that we share the word of God. We take the time to share the word of God. It amazes me as I look back in my life how much time I have been willing to give to certain things. I have always been a fanatic at whatever I've done. And so when I give my time, I give everything. I, when Pastor Terry Lutz and I used to golf. We were up at 5.30 every morning. We golfed 146 rounds of golf one year. 146 rounds of golf we golfed in one year. And uh, so we would get up and we would be on the golf course by 6 o'clock, 6.15. We'd do 18 holes before 9 because we could really fly. There was nobody on the course. And we'd be back in our offices by 9 in the morning. We would then have men's night later on at night. The greatest example of time that I can think of is with my children. When we were in Dixon, both of our kids belonged to the Innisfail Dolphin Swim Team. You talk about consuming time. You know, I, I just mentioned a few minutes ago, Clayton Chemtrap. Clayton was an amazing hockey player, and hockey takes so much time. But boy, it's nothing compared to swimming. Every day we would drive Stefan and Laurel Ann from Dixon into Innisfail, about 20 minutes, and then wait for them for two and a half hours every day of swimming. Then on the weekends there were swim meets. And because Stefan was very good at it, 
he then started to com compete provincially. And so soon we were going to swim meets in Edmonton and at the university and it just went on and on and on. When I look at people who donate that kind of time for their children, the question always comes to my mind, how much time are you now willing to encourage your children to take advantage of in church? Why are our churches empty of kids? Why? Why are you as parents so willing to take your kids for hockey, for curling, for golf, for whatever it might be, and keep them away from their church? I, I don't get it. I just don't get it. If tomorrow, if tomorrow I found a cure for this virus that's going around right now, if I found out and found a, you know, if you take uh, two sips of this, you spin around three times, pat your head once, then knock it against the wall four times, you're cured. If I came up with that and it worked, people would be lining up from here to Las Vegas to find out the truth of it. They would want to know exactly what they have to do to be made well, and boy, would I have attention. Well, folks, I can tell you right now, right now, what you can do to experience eternal life. I can tell you how you can undo rot in the grave. I can share a method with you that will get you out of the ground. When they put you in, I can tell you how you can get out and find eternal youth, eternal life. Why aren't the churches full of people clamoring to find that out? Why? Why wouldn't you dedicate your Sundays to experiencing a Lord and Savior who will give you that cure for all of the foolishness that we are willing to do instead? According to Paul, it's because of sin. I've heard so many people tell me that Sunday is a family day. Don't bug us on Sunday because it's a family day. Ah, oh, baloney. It isn't a family day. It's the Lord's day. Stop giving it away to all the nonsense in your life and come back to the church where you can hear the word of God and experience fellowship with other Christians and be encouraged and strengthened. And if you really want to know the meaning for life, then come and find it out because I can tell you. I can tell you why you're here. I can tell you what it's all about. Come and conform your life to his. He calls us to do just that. Our talents, our time, our money. I'm sorry, but he wants it all. He wants you. You're his child and he wants you. I have two children. I have Stefan and Laurel Ann. Laurel Ann will phone me and she and I can talk for hours. As a matter of fact, we do almost every single day. I hear her talking to Valerie sometimes at 10 o'clock at night, and they will talk for two hours. And I mean almost every day. Stefan, on the other hand, I can't get two words out of him. And I can write him, and I can encourage him, and I can coerce him, I can phone him, I can text him, I can email him. I can send every message I want to Stefan, and I'll get a one-word answer, and hardly ever that. He hardly says a word to me. And I long to hear his voice. It's just the way he is. He's not a talkative guy. I always thought he would be, but, but he's not. He turned out to be one of these guys that just doesn't want to visit for long periods of time. At least not with me. 
and I long to hear his voice. I, I really do. I wish for all the world that I could spend more time with my son. I would spend every hour of every waking hour of every day with him if I could. Because he's my son. And I love him more than any other thing on this earth. Except for maybe my Annie and my Valerie, Landon, Megan, Peter, my family. It's the same way with our God. It's the same way with your Heavenly Father. He desires more than anything else to hear your voice. I'm not making this up. I'm, I'm not kidding. He wants you. He doesn't want a piece of you. He doesn't want the leftovers. He doesn't want the time you have for him after you've played golf and you've gone curling and you've gone and watched the football game and you sunbathed and you, you did all the other things. You exercised for three hours so that you could look good for who knows who. He wants your A game. He wants the best that you have. He wants your upfront time, not the leftover time. And if you think about it for even a second, you can understand this. I just told you why, and you can understand it. You who are parents know exactly what I'm saying. Is there anything that gives you joy like the voice of your children? Now, some of you may have young children, and well, right now you're kind of questioning that. But believe me, as time goes on, how I love the voice of my little girl. How I love the voice of my son. How God loves to hear you pray. He wants your time. He wants your energy. He wants your love. He wants you and he wants all of you, not a piece, all of you. Notice the plea here. Paul uses the word urge. I urge you. Often as Christians, we need to be urged because we're so apathetic. I can remember so many times in my life where Ladies' church groups had to cancel because they couldn't find amongst their 25 or 30 followers somebody who would commit to be the leader. I can remember men's groups that would fail to form and keep going because nobody would step forward and commit to be a leader. It is so hard to find people to come on church council because, well, we have other things to do. It's so hard to find people who will want to teach Sunday school. It's even harder finding people who want to attend Sunday school. Well, because our kids are busy. Oh, I, my Johnny loves to play hockey on Sunday morning. And, you know, and, and so we, we do what Johnny wants to do. And so if Johnny wants to play hockey, then it's hockey. That's what we do Sunday mornings. You know, when I hear parents say things like that, it always makes me wonder, if Johnny decided he didn't want to go to school, do you allow that? Or Johnny's got a temperature of 105, and you take him and say, Johnny, we got to go to the hospital. But Johnny says, well, Mom, I don't want to go to the hospital. Do we leave Johnny at home in his bed? Because well, he just doesn't want to go. Well, if those things are true... As insignificant as this life is and going to school is in comparison to your eternal life, to life forever, don't you think you should be encouraging Johnny to set aside his hockey and go to church where he can learn about the Word of God and share in his faith and grow as a Christian? And as a leader among men, I, 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 don't, I just don't get it. 
Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your whole bodies as living sacrifices, holy and, complete and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act. Paul is saying, I urge you, give yourselves to the Lord. Not just a little bit, all of it. Give it all to the Lord. Give your children to the Lord. Bring them to church. Get them up in the mornings. Get them to church. Get them to Sunday school. Get them to confirmation. Help them to learn about Christ Jesus. It is their eternal life. We are urged by Paul. I don't know how else he could make it any stronger. Now you may say, why would God even want me? I, I mean, I'm not really that important. What difference does it make whether I come or whether my child comes? What difference does it make? Folks, <laughs> it makes all the difference in the world. As I finished saying just moments ago, it's, it's like your own children. What difference does it make if they're involved in your life? It makes all the difference. It's the same with your heavenly father. And he wants you to sacrifice yourself to him, for him. Remember, remember, as a living sacrifice, we honor our father by giving him our everything. We have to understand that the death we have to this world and the conforming of our lives to Christ Jesus has eternal consequences. That's the cost of commitment. Bonhoeffer said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. When Christ calls a woman, he bids her to come and die. If we are not willing to give God our all, we are not willing to truly follow him. And when we give him our all, we make ourselves a sacrifice and we die. But through this death, this death to self, comes resurrection life. Life that's eternal comes because of this sacrifice. There are two living sacrifices in the Bible. There's Isaac and there's Jesus. Both were offered to God. When Isaac was spared and allowed to live, it was said of him that he received back his life. He had already been offered in the mind of Abraham three days earlier when God spoke to Abraham. Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose again in resurrection life. We too rise to newness of life as we lay down our lives at the foot of the cross of Christ. We too have a resurrection life. We give ourselves wholly and completely to God and we are raised up as new creations. And this is again one of those universal truths. We have no way out. We are called to do this, and anything less is not acceptable. In Revelation, it talks about being lukewarm. I will spit you out. You are either hot or you're cold. You're on one side of the fence or you're on the other. You don't get to be in the middle, not as a Christian. You either give all of yourself or none of yourself and even if you give parts, God does not see that as commitment, as conformity. You must give yourself to your Lord. This is called our spiritual act of worship. It's true worship. It's the true giving of ourselves wholly and completely. You see, we as believers, we can live on three levels. The sensual, the soulish, or the spiritual. And by sensual, I mean that we are ruled by our senses. 
We are ruled by our desires. You may be a Christian and, and be sensual. You will not go to Bible study because it's too hot or it's too cold or you need to do something for yourself on that occasion. But you won't come to worship because you're too tired. You will not work with certain people because you're uncomfortable with them and, well, they said something one day that you don't like and so now you won't have anything to do with them. Or maybe they just smell bad. Now this is Christianity on its very lowest plane. And one of the single most frustrating things in my life is this kind of Christianity. When people stop coming to church because they're mad at me because of something I said or something I did and so they're going to punish God in order to get even with me. And then there are those who don't get their way, and so they stop coming to church. I wanted green carpet. You bought red. I'm out. I don't want to come to church anymore. Now, I know people that have done this. I'm not kidding. It wasn't carpet. It wasn't anything as, as insignificant as carpet. It was the drapes. They stopped coming for the drapes. Let us never consider throwing away our relationship with God over the insignificant. There are so many pseudo-Christians out there. This kind of Christian I, I call the soulless Christian. Here we're talking about those Christians who have the intellect. They know it all. They have been taught it all. They've been part of church their whole lives and they know how to go through the motions. They can stand up on Sunday morning and they can say the Kyrie with great energy and excitement. Of course, they say it, but they don't feel anything. The thoughts of Calvary bring tears to their eyes, but they have never met the Spirit of God. I've met people in their 90s who have hardly ever missed a day at church, and they still have never known the Spirit of God. There's that kind of Christian too. So there's the sensual and there's the soulish. We have to live on a plane that intimately connects us with God. Not superficially, not just based on sensuality, not just based on our head knowledge. We have to have a relationship with God that throws it all in. We have to give ourselves wholly and completely. You see, to live on a spiritual plane, you must be controlled by the Spirit. You must be guided by the Spirit. Now, believe it or not, I am only halfway through my sermon on this point. So I'm going to just wrap it up somehow here. And that's going to be hard to do. So just bear with me. Please try to understand all of this. Not only are we challenged by God's mercy to be more than just head knowledge Christians, to be more than just sensually involved in the surroundings that make up the church, but we are to change in a type of metamorphosis. There must be a transformation going on within us. When we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, we do it once for all time. That's the connotation of the word that we find in Greek. That means metamorphosis, to change wholly and completely. But we have a problem. There is a danger of us submitting to the pressures around us as we live in this world. We have a danger of giving ourselves wholly and completely to the wrong thing. And Paul addresses it. He says these words. He says, Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. Don't be sucked away from God, from worship in Christ Jesus, and be drawn back into the world. The problem we face is that the world seeks to make us after its own image. There is pressure all the time to be fashioned after it. The word for conformed in the Greek, I can hardly pronounce it, is, is, is like sachematzio. Now, it refers to an outward appearance or likeness. It means being shaped after the fashion of something. Now, I'm not talking about what kind of clothes you wear or 
how you style your hair. Being fashioned after the world is much more than that. The world is humanity apart from God. It's us going our own way. It's us doing our own thing. The world is putting self at the center. It too wants all of you. Satan wants all of you too. And that's the worldliness I'm talking about. It's the attitude that permeates in our world today. You can find it even in Christians. Some Christians look at church in a worldly way. It always drives me nuts when I go to a church council meeting and we start talking about government loans and government money and bank money. We take our faith from God and we put it into something other than God. Whether it's the government or a bank or whatever it might be. And we cannot do that. We cannot allow ourselves to be drawn away. I'll never forget in Dixon, and some of you who are from Dixon who are listening right now, you can remember this. When we were looking at building on to the front of our church and we were going to put a new uh, expansion on, you can see the picture up behind me, right right, right there. Uh, the picture, you can see the, the new wood. That, that was our new entrance that we built onto the front of the church. And when we started talking about how to build that, there were right away cries to reach out to the Wild Rose Fund and borrow money from that. Matter of fact, there was, uh, I, I, there might have even been money that they would just give us to use for that. And of course, the Wild Rose Fund was money that was gathered together from gambling. And right away, there were many in the church that said, no, absolutely not. We will not conform to the world. We will not get into bed with governments. We'll raise the money ourselves. And of course, we put out a plea. It went into the bulletin. And in a matter of a few days, people stepped forward to loan money, to give money. I, I, I was blown away. I, I don't remember what it was. I, th I think it was eighty five or $90,000 was raised overnight. We did not allow our church to be drawn into it. We are called to reject the philosophy and the lifestyle outright of this world. My dad used to say, and I'll never forget this, a dog can whip a skunk, but it's just not worth it. A dog can whip a skunk, it's just not worth it. It's not worth the fight. But Christ is, Jesus is worth the transformation, the change, the fight. There is a process by which we become more like Christ. In Romans, it's called metaphorsathai. And I've murdered the pronunciation of that. But it's where we get the word metamorphosis. And it's an interesting word in that it contains the Greek word morph, which means essence. What we have in view here is a change of nature, not merely an outward change, but like a caterpillar, everything changes. We are different creatures. We are completely, radically turned inside out different when we give ourselves to Christ Jesus. Part of the process is, of course, as Paul says in these just these two little chapters, two little verses, is the renewing of your minds. As our minds are renewed, our inner selves are changed. It is the inner person that becomes like Christ. It's not just some fake little thing. We give our whole, our everything to Christ Jesus. We're told in Philippians chapter 4 to think about such things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Think about these things. We can only do that by meditating on the Word of God. We must seek that Word wholly and completely in all things. You don't just get to dabble in it. And when we commit, we commit our all. As we read it ourselves, as we consider it ourselves, think of the witnesses that have gone before you.
Just think about what they have said to you, what they shared with you. Now, I don't have Mrs. Kent here anymore or Mrs. Lurch. I don't have Arnold or Art. Miss Margaret is gone. Pastor Terry Lutz, Elmer Cure, a great man. Eric Anderson is gone. Helen, Barbie Doll, so many are gone. But while they were alive, they cried out time and time again to seek the word of God, to seek the lessons that come from knowing Christ Jesus. I heard all of those people I just said say, read your Bibles, spend time in devotion, and then give yourself wholly and completely to the Lord your God who died for you, who died with your name on his mind. We must be challenged. We must be renewed. We must be obedient and give ourselves to the Lord. And this brings us to the proof of the change working within us. As we are changed by the renewing of our minds, we come to the place where we not only know the will of God, but we begin to live it. One more button up here. We begin to live it, and people see it. They see the change. I've told you all many times, and I love, love this story, but Harry Meyer and I, one summer, uh, Harry and I, his mom and dad, went to Spain for a holiday, and they allowed Harry and I to look after, do a house sitting at their house. Well, they lived in an 11,000 square foot house, and it, it was a mansion of mansions. Oh, it was so beautiful. It was so much fun. This house had everything, every gadget. The coolest thing back in the day was it had uh, an 18 foot, it was called an earth station satellite dish. And you could sit in a chair and it had this big giant dial and you could move this dial and this massive satellite dish would move outside. You could hear it as it, as, as it clicked. And there were no restrictions back then so we could watch whatever it would tune into. Oh, it was fun. Well, the weeks went by and we started attending, Harry and I, a Bible study downtown Calgary. And it was in a house that had four floors and the top floor of the house was this big uh, open room and it had a bench that ran around the outside. If you've been to Dixon, to the youth room in Dixon, it was almost identical to that. Matter of fact, I fashioned the Dixon youth room after that experience. And when we'd go to that house, the people were so happy. They, they lived there, a whole bunch of them. They were Christian hippies. They were flower children. And they had come up there from the 60s, and they were about as turned on a Christian as a person could be. They all wore, you know, bell-bottom pants, and they had yellow flowers, you know, sewn to their pants. And the men had, you know, their hair was you know, tied up and it had little bells and feathers in it. And, and the thing that I remember more than anything else was that they all smiled. Every time they caught you glancing at them, they would break out in a smile. And at first I thought it was just, you know, silly. It was just baloney, but it wasn't. It was for real. They were really happy. I met people there who had given their all to Christ Jesus and they were changed. I wanted to have that kind of happiness in my life. I wanted that kind of joy. I wanted to be that kind of Christian. That kind of Christian that's just filled with the love of God and it just overflows in everything you say and do. You've all met that kind of person. Maybe you are that kind of person. I hope so. The kind of person that is just so filled with the love of the Lord. Okay, I got to wrap this up. In the end, as I said, he wants your everything. Like you as a parent want your son or daughter's voice in your life, he wants your voice in his. 
So conform unto him, be challenged, be changed, wholly and completely, be transformed. Come to Christ. Change your life and give it all over to him. The drinking, the smoking, the bad language, the foul images, the fighting. Give it all away. Give it away and conform to the love of the Lord. Amen. Oh, I lost a lot of people. I'm sorry I went way, way, way too long. What time is it? Oi, oi, oi. That's the longest sermon of my life. Anyhow, let us pray. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, your son is the son of David, whose kingdom never ends. Extend your everlasting kingdom of grace and mercy to all people on earth. Continue to strengthen those whom you have brought into your kingdom by grace through faith, helping them to conform their lives to you. Bring faith to those who have none. Help those who are children of the Lord to grow in faith and knowledge, giving their full hearts and minds to you by grace through faith. Bring to faith all those yet remaining outside your kingdom and those who live superficial lives of faith. Help them, Lord, to give all to you. Heavenly Father, bless us this day. Bless George. Bless Nancy. Bless Bob and Blake and Rod and Linda and so many, many more. Bring them to healing, Lord. Allow them the time to fully give themselves to you. Help parents to put priorities in place that would bring their children to you first. Help grandparents to openly challenge bringing their grandchildren to worship you. Guard and keep us, Lord. Keep us safe, we pray, from this terrible illness that is sweeping through our land. I pray especially for our children. As you look to us, your children, we look to our own. So for me today, I pray for my Stefan and Annie, and each of you will pray for your children at this time. Grant us your peace, your presence in our very lives. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Well, that's it, folks. I'm sorry. I went way, way, way too long. I rambled on. I probably said the same thing about 15 times over and over again. Is there a more important thing that I could say than what I said today? I don't think so. I really don't. It is. It's our everything. We either conform to Christ Jesus and give ourselves wholly, completely to him, or we face the consequences of that, and I don't want to face those consequences, and I surely don't want you to. So God be with you. We'll see you tomorrow, 11 o'clock, on the nose. I promise not to do this again. Tomorrow's sermon will be no longer than 45 minutes. <laughs> okay. Love you all. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.